uh, thank uh, Matthew and Bevan and the, uh, the other organizers for the opportunity to join you this morning. And I suppose as a uh, segue from uh, Kevin's talk then, uh, uh, I'm here to point out to at least those of you uh, on the manufacturing side with respect to uh, medical devices with the diagnostic application um, that I represent one of many uh, elements of the glue or the fabric as far as tying some of these needs for uh, medical device application, et cetera, uh, together. So using evaluation of or evaluation processes for uh, diagnostic assays as a model uh, within laboratory medicine, my, my hope today is that I, I'll do a, a couple of quick overviews with respect to um, how I, as a, as a medical microbiologist in a cl clinical setting, how I approach a method evaluation, and then try to tie that in to the business and the marketing and development side of things from a, for a manufacturer uh, in the context of Health Canada requirements uh, and where things overlap with respect to uh, MDA applications. Uh, and, but really at the end and sort of as an overview, my hope then is that I can help to help you to identify where it's a, uh, a, um, appropriate uh, ways that clinical laboratories, either micro, hematology, et cetera, uh, can facilitate a lot of the needs within clinical evaluation context uh, for medical device application and Health Canada submission dossiers. So f just as a matter of introduction, uh, who are we or what are we? So the medical microbiology department at the University of Alberta Hospital is a full service uh, clinical diagnostic micro laboratory. Um, we cover a broad service range, uh, both acute care diagnostics at the hospital as well as uh, we provide the provincial uh, laboratory and public health uh, service mandate for the province. A uh, great load of uh, the work that we carry is for microbial identification, so whether that be bacterial, viral, or fungal, uh, and then as a, uh, a, a, a joint component of that, we do a lot of antimicrobial susceptibility testing, so whether it's antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, um, again, uh, putting a name on the organism for the clinician is only half of the job. We need to give them a, a, some assistance uh, with respect to how to treat that potential infection. Uh, as a matter of quality and validation, we are fully accredited laboratory, uh, obviously to work with under th uh, within the umbrella of Alberta Health Services. Um, we are both accredited by the College of American Pathologists, which is quite uh, universal for laboratories in North America, as well as provincially through the college, the Alberta College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, and I think it, it should be noted, but it goes without saying that we also uh, have a fully integrated and adopted system uh, for approach to quality and quality, quality system essential framework, which at least in my world is recognized as a standard of practice anymore. And again, the, the body that provides the recommendations is noted here, so Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. So when we're talking about in vitro diagnostic devices or product evaluation, uh, at least on my side of the fence, I, I understand what that is. I would call that test method evaluation. Uh, slightly different jargon, but it's the same, uh, same practice. And in essence, this is a core element of our clinical practice. Uh, it's well, first and foremost, um, it's my responsibility as a microbiologist to make sure that the tests and the methods that we provide from a diagnostic context is bringing the highest level of quality care to the patient uh, or to the bedside. Uh, but equally though, it's important that as a matter of, acc of accreditation to function as a clinical laboratory, we have to go through an, uh, the formal evaluation process for all of the te test methods and services that we provide. So whether it be a uh, commercially available uh, assay or if it's something we're developing or have developed in-house, our responsibilities are to both verify and validate the performance of quality. And I'll expand on both of these in a moment. Uh, but how do we do this? Well, I mean, it, there are volumes of procedures and processes, uh, standard operating uh, procedures uh, that we already have in place through our QSC program that in brief walk you through the establishing a formal needs assessment for whatever your application or uh, test method may be, how to design the study, and then making sure that the completion of the study you can do a formal and appropriate impact assessment or uh, the benefit of the outcome. So not to review for this room, but just as a matter of definition, when you're talking about medical device applications, Health Canada does um, categorize things uh, in four classes. 
Uh, class one and two medical devices, again, uh, really don't need a whole lot of clinical evaluation as far as Health Canada is concerned. That may be a bit overgeneralized for some class two devices, but for today, we're really, we're talking about class three devices uh, from a diagnostic perspective, and these are the ones, that, and four as well, but that really doesn't enter into my realm. Uh, but these are the devices that do require uh, a quite sophisticated pre-market review documentation for Health Canada application. And really, uh, the, the easy jargon for me anyways is this is a clinical evaluation of safety and efficacy. So this is part of my everyday, as I mentioned. And so to put it into context, then how do I approach an evaluation of a new assay or of a new test method. There are several resources, uh, international standards that we can use. Uh, Kumatech is one of the publications. I've made reference here to one of the publications that actually identifies the specifics within the world of uh, clinical microbiology, but there's a range of these depending on the specialty or the test application you're considering. Um, but again, whether it be CLSI or c the CAP checklist as well, there's a lot of overlapping themes and uh, good laboratory good laboratory practices, excuse me, uh, incorporated into these documents. And that goes without saying that Health Canada and the FDA also have equivalent documentations, although for me they're a little bit more difficult to read. Um, but there are overlapping themes, and again, uh, FDA at least is represented uh, quite nicely uh, with respect to their requirements in the Kumatech resource. So. As a matter of establishing framework then within these resource materials, and I'll draw from the Kumatech publication, for me to do a proper evaluation, I have to, f and this is, sorry, in the context of a commercially available assay, for me to implement this into clinical service, we have to first do a verification. And as defined, this is simply the first step, one time confirmation that the test works as indicated in the product insert, as deemed by the manufacturer. Uh, in comparison, a validation then is that continual confirmation after you've done the verification uh, that the test still works and continues to work over the, the, uh, the duration of its application within laboratory setting. So the verification is really what I want to draw your attention to because this is also very, probably very similar to your approach as a manufacturer then uh, if this is your specialization uh, for how to meet Health Canada and FDA requirements for application for your uh, medical device. In my, whoops, in my uh, practice anyhow, f if nothing else, I have to satisfy accuracy and precision. So simply to find accuracy then is the rate of true positive and true negative values of any head-to-head -head comparison of your test method versus your reference standard. Uh, and then precision, which is reproducibility. So however you set up your replicate testing, how confidently can the test reproduce the same result? And so depending on the sophistication of your study, uh, you may just need to establish reproducibility within runs or perhaps between runs or even then start to tease out reproducibility between operators. Other elements then of a verification may also involve the reportable range or the reference range. Again, other performance measures that first give you a sense of the full dynamic spectrum of measure of the assay from the high and low values, uh, but bringing it into clinical context, what's the reference range and can it represent normal values uh, required for uh, healthcare delivery? Uh, not to leave them out, but perhaps uh, not to say less important, but these other measures are somewhat included in the precision and the accuracy components that I mentioned. You, have to, you need to measure sensitivity, right? Uh, can you actually detect the analyte or the disease that you're after? Uh, or analytical sensitivity then, which is more, uh, a little bit more um, absolute in its measure. Specificity again, uh, but these two, both sensitivity and specificity, if you're not already aware, are important values to have attached to the performance record of an assay. Um, but really, what's most important is the predictive value. And the predictive value draws off of sensitivity and specificity, but you need to have an idea of the, the prevalence of disease or whatever it is that you're actually measuring within that test method. Uh, and this is something that we can help with from a hospital or a clinical care setting. Uh, disease prevalence is something that we can provide information to, which then really, really substantiates what well, my apologies, really substantiates the value of uh, sensitivity and specificities included within product inserts. <coughs> 